Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, Chart Lessons 2. The reason it's called Chart Lessons 2 is because somewhere, sometime in the past, probably over a year ago, there was something called Chart Lessons. So that makes this Chart Lessons 2 free event for all members Tuesday, October 22nd. I put another special little tag, had a little tag put on the last email saying this is a really good event. I tend to do that once in a while. <laughs> Remember, though, like two or three back, I said this is actually going to be not a very good event. So I was just warning you, but this is, uh, I think, a, a pretty good one. I guess by good, I mean in terms of something that I think anybody can learn something from. If you're brand new and sticking your toes in, I, I suspect that, I'm not going to ask, but I suspect that half of you are probably in the category that you have studied the markets on your own, informally, read, maybe took some kind of rather simple or, or, or not simple education, but you're just not really doing a whole lot right now. I suspect for us, for half of you are stick, I call it sticking your toes in the water. And I suspect about a, a quarter of you are really new to the point you're, you're just kicking the tires and feeling things around. And I suspect about a quarter of you are probably what I would call the more educated group or the more experienced group but maybe not necessarily happy with where you are. Some of you are, you know, are happy in here just learning more stuff. I know several of my students are here, and I know some of you are doing very well. Seasoned. You're more than seasoned, sir. You are outstanding. So whatever you're here for, I think tonight will provide some good things because I actually tell, you may not believe this, I actually tell my seminar program people that they need to be at these because there's actually good learning that goes on. As a matter of fact, you know, what's interesting is a lot of stuff that you learn, as you all know, there's there's different levels. When I present something, there's different levels you can receive it at. And somebody brand new to the market may not be able to grasp a lot of what's going on. And, and it's, it's in some cases, people really have a higher level of learning to get some of the finer points. So there's something, I think, across the board for everybody. You may take something really important from it, um, but somebody else may get something completely different from it. So this is going to be a very educational one. So let's get to it as they say tonight. This is just kind of the blah blah slide. Missing piece of the puzzle. Sometimes that's the case, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes Glenn, to a certain point, the more you learn, the more questions you have, which is a good thing. And the more you're thirsty for more things. And the more thirsty you are, the more you open your mind to learn more things. Until you hit that saturation point, and that's when you are quote unquote successful. Here's the, the blah, blah slide. You know, that's done a week ahead of time to advertise for it, and it's just kind of fairly generic. When I actually get down to doing these sometimes, it becomes much more specific as I focus in on a topic. And as I, and I, I did the topic this week, um, or as I got to the topic, I probably could have renamed this. It's kind of a, a, a little two-part thing. So let's go through and take a look at it. It is going to have some chart examples from from trades and also some chart examples from um, just things to show you let's start off we're going to get right to it here question this is just a just a question this is just a like i said this is chart lessons so let me give you a little piece of paul advice and i do want to emphasize it said it i think on one of the advertisements for tonight that i am certainly not a person all of you that know me that says you know there's only one way to do stuff because there's not there's just, there's a lot of different ways to make money in the market but there are often right ways and wrong ways to do things and there are things that are just wrong there are things that people do that are just wrong the market is all about odds and it's all about a variety of different opportunities you know there's actually a great example you know today there's a member in the room i don't think he's here i don't think he comes to these but he goes, you know, way back with me. I mean, decades and I mean, more than 10 years. And he was all about going long. What was it today? What was the gap down thing? Yeah. Uh, no, not PG. Um, PG is the one I shorted. It's the one I said I was going to short. Come on, come on, come on, come on. KMB. Yeah, KMB. So he he's a good trader, you know, and he wanted to go long KMB. And I'm like, well, I'll, I'll short the rally. <laughs> And if you look at KMB, this has nothing to do with tonight's presentation, but it, it's just kind of making my point that there's no one way to do things necessarily, and it, and it, it but there are right and wrong things. So he went on a long KMB here, and we had we had a little side bet. Yeah, you always side with him. You always take his stuff. I know you did. And he took it down here, and guess what? He made a ton of money. He did great. And I made him a side bet. It wouldn't hit 133. 
<laughs> they came out to they came out to 132.86, and I said I was right, and I do not owe him a T-shirt. And he said that was close enough. I said nope, wasn't quite close enough. But my point was that I actually wanted to short the 15 minute sell setup. I wanted to short this. And which one was better? Well, the short probably worked out a little bit better. I didn't end up doing this because I got involved with something else. I'm just saying, but there's two different ways to do things. Now, me personally, I can't go along that. It just, you know, mentally, the way I am fixated and learned and self-taught and whatever, I, I have a hard time doing that. I couldn't manage it well because I don't believe in that trade, but I have no, no doubt it could have done that. I said, okay, fine. I'm not doing that one. So I'm just saying there are different ways to do things, but there are things that are just purely wrong. And that's what we need to always focus on. Something I, I, I think I'm going to bring out tonight, maybe, but if I don't, I want to mention it here that it's not always just about trying to get the home run trade. As a matter of fact, most people who try to get the home run trades usually end up losers unless you know they know how to do it really, really properly. But think about it. If you could improve your education, your perception, your knowledge, your confidence, your whatever you want to call it, to the point that you only had half the losers that you do, would that make a difference in your trading? It's, it's kind of a um, rhetorical question. You don't really have to answer it because if anybody wiped out half their losers, it would take even a, a relatively poor trader and make them quite profitable. So if, you, if, you, if the answer to that question was still no, then you have some real problems. But So it, it's not just always about how can I find the home run. It's about, hey, give me any chart. How can I maximize it the best that I can? Whether it's to, to minimize a, a bad trade, to know when to, to manage it properly, or when to go for the gust go on, on a bigger move. So here's a question I have for you. This is just a first side topic. Again, this is like a little conglomerate of two or three different ideas here. And that's why it's called chart lessons and why it has no specific title. In a bullish market, be bullishly biased. That's a statement. In a bearish market, be bearishly biased. And it says biased because I'm not saying it's illegal to ever take a short in a bullish market. There's lots of times you can, you can do that. But I'm just saying the general concept is if everything's being bought right off the chart, go with the flow, right? That's the number one rule in trading, and it is amazingly still a very good rule. You know, don't fight the trend. So if it's bullish, be bullish. If it's bearish, be bearish. But here's a question for you, and for these questions, I only have three or four, so I want to give you some time to answer them. Even get a little debate going if you want. Um, in a sideways, sloppy, or can't tell environment, what should you be? Julie, I'm going to put like a 30-second delay on your answers because you're usually too good with your answers. Be patient, flat, wait, flexible, out, ready to short, ha. Huh. Okay, now you see, I just, you, you, obviously, you know, I'm not writing these slides as we're talking, right? <laughs> oh, that was a lock and word. I'm an idiot, aren't I? <laughs> I retract the compliment to you, Julie. You're not all that smart. You just simply know how to log into the program. Obviously, you know, I'm not writing this as we go, so I want you to understand how well I know you guys. You ready for this? Here's, this is a slide I obviously made <laughs> before right now question mark and okay <laughs> not you always said do nothing nothing is always okay see I knew you were gonna answer that it wasn't hard to figure that out because it's not a bad answer but what if that goes on forever right and this is my issue that I've, I've talked about in other seminars and other webinars is that you know there's this concept out there that I think is an amateur comment I, and I know when I say this you may think I'm the amateur to say this but there's this comment out there that I think is an amateur comment, which is always wait for perfect patterns. Well, that's kind of like, you know, buy low and sell high. What does that mean, wait for a perfect pattern? What, what, if, what if things just kind of go sloppy forever and you have to make money? Or, you know, what, what is too sloppy? Isn't there a border down case always? You know, I mean, when, when is it? So if you, choose, if you do choose to do something, what should it be? All right, T. Smith has an okay answer. He's going to try and, and minimize that sloppiness by, by selling spreads, which actually is a good answer because that's something that options gives you. It gives that a, you a, a wide range to be right. In other words, options, obviously, T. to do options, you still need to know where the underlying stuff is going, right? You, you can't just blindly take something on something. So, but it, it Options allow you to skew it so that your, um, your your success, your batting average, is much higher because you have a wide range of where you can be right. Um, you have smaller profits, of course. So that actually is not a bad answer. But in terms of reading the charts and figuring out where we're going, which way should you what what should you do? What should you favor? Range bound trading zones, oscillators. Okay. 
here's the way I kind of teach it, Joe, and that's a good answer also, quite honestly, is um, I teach that there are up trends, you know, bullish patterns, there are down trends, there are bearish patterns, and there are sideways patterns, right, Joe? In other words, there are, but when you have a sideways pattern, that's not what I call sloppy or can't tell. In other words, there's kind of a fourth critter out there, which is sideways, but not like strategically sideways, just a mess. You know what I mean? It's kind of what's left over when you're not up, you're not down, you're not sideways. You know what I mean, Joe? So I'm talking about that. I'm not talking about when you're just nicely range brown because that's a nice pattern. You know, there's up, there's down, there's sideways, right? Those, those are your three trends, up, down, sideways. I'm saying, what about when you're not up, down, or sideways? You're just, you think you're up, you think you're down, you think you just don't know, you're all over the place. Well, I, all you're afraid to say it, but there is an answer. And this answer, you're not going to find in a textbook. The answer you're going to find from me and a lot of stuff I'm telling you is just from years and years of sitting here day after day staring at charts. I, I've, I, I'm willing to say, I mean, I've, I'm going to put myself there to say I've looked at more charts than as much as anybody in the world. I mean, I'm not kidding you. I mean, it's, it's 20 years staring at charts every single day. Even even slow people like me tend to learn something. Yeah, we covered sit on hands, Chuck. We know that already. But we're saying, what if you can't anymore, right? And the, I, I want to get this point across to you because I think it's a very valid point. I think it's something that helps me a lot. And that is, if you have to act... You, you are better off in a sloppy environment is shorting rallies than you are buying pullbacks. You're better off shorting rallies than buying pullbacks. That's something I want you to think about. Of course, the next question you ask is why? 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 Why is that a better concept? There's an obvious answer that some of you are going to say pretty quickly, but I want you to think even beyond that a little bit. And I mean this quite seriously. I, I'll tell you, while, while you're giving me some answers, while you're giving me some answers, let me give you something that I can tell you to back this up a little bit. And that is just some experience working with people. I, 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 and I don't have a real statistic on this. Like I can't show you a spreadsheet that says this is true. I can, again, I can just tell you, you know, my mind has computed this over the years. And that is if I took all the people that had a really tough time with this and failed and said, who's bullish, who's bears? I bet you the vast majority of people that fail are permabulls. They're always bullish. And I was like, all the people that did really well at this. I bet you they're way more bearishly oriented people than there are bullish. And by bearishly oriented, I don't mean it is a bad thing. I don't mean that you can't read a chart. I just mean you kind of favor the downside. I, I do that. I favor the downside, right? Right. Things do fall faster than they rally. That, that cannot be argued. Look at any chart, any time period. Statistically, they fall faster than they rally. No question about it. Peter, you actually, wow, impressive. I mean, that's not the way I was going to phrase it, but you are getting the second part of the answer. What I like to phrase it as is this. More people are bullishly biased, right? So in a sloppy environment, things hit a quote-unquote bottom and people try and people go to buy it. If it's just, in other words, what if the big money's sitting out? And, and by the way, folks, that's what causes sloppy sideways environments. When big money is coming in and they're buying or selling something, guess what? There's a pattern there. If big money is battling it out, there oftentimes becomes a sideways pattern there. But when big money kind of leaves the picture, oftentimes traders are left playing with themselves, as I like to say, and things just are sloppy. So if you're at a bottom, think about this, and people are, generally speaking, are bullishly biased, the average person out there, and you're trying to lift something off the bottom, it starts to move off the bottom, and there's no big money, guess what? There's nothing to propel it. But think about it the other way. You rally for a while and you reach some area. And the people who are long, who have been long, are the mom and pop trader Joe traders. Guess what happens? Things start to sell. There's a snowball effect. It's not just that they fall faster in general, but when you hit a top properly, you normally get a sharp move down immediately. And guess what that does for you from a management point of view, from a profit point of view? And I'll show you an example on a chart in a minute. If you remind me, I didn't have the chart here for that purpose. But does that make sense, everybody? Does that make sense? And I can only tell you, again, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm only here to try and help you. That doesn't matter to me what you think. I don't care if you believe me or not. I'm just telling you lots of experience. And for those of you that are fantastically successful and you don't want to listen to some of what I say, that's fine. You know, just discard it. Um, you have the right to absorb or throw away whatever you want. But I'm just telling you, you know, if I had like 10 fingers like I do or eight fingers and two thumbs of 
magic little bullets I could hand you, that would really be one of them probably. If it's bullish, be bullish. If it's bearish, be bearish. And if things are sloppy and a mess and you're going to trade, short rallies. And people in the room with me, I mean, true. I mean, I'm short more than I'm long, without question, especially lately because we're in a sloppy environment. As a matter of fact, right? so again, I'm not just saying this. I'm giving you the advice that I use every day. I was all short yesterday and all short today. Yesterday and today, I only had one long trade. And the long trade, I actually put down as a mistake for myself. It was, it was, a, it was a bad trade. So I do feel that way and focus that way. So there's, there's a topic. Let's go on to the next topic. Next topic. This is topic number two, and I can't put the, I can't put the topic up there because if I do, it'll give away the answer to the question. Let's take a vote. These are four daily charts, and I've covered up the names temporarily so that you can't go and cheat. This is chart number, ready? Watching the slide here. There's chart one, two, three, and four. Question for you is, of these charts here, which chart would you like the best, period? Now, when I say best, I don't want you to parse it out and talk to me about batting average or parse it out and talk to me about the biggest target. I'm saying if you had to take, if you took 10 trades, which one ends up making the most money? Which makes the most money? So that cuts through all the statistical crap and all the batting average and all the, all the minced words you want to do. Just saying bottom line it over a number of trades, which one do you like the best? So there's that one there. Chart number one, and again, I also know you're going to say, show me some other time frames, but I'm not going to give you that. I'm just going to simply say, with the information you have in front of you, because the answer I want to get to just involves what we're looking at. I know, and you know what, if you are good, well, no, you don't have enough information there. So these are daily charts, and I know you'd maybe like to say, show me a weekly or a monthly. I understand that I would certainly never take a trade without knowing more information. But I'm just saying, given the information you have, because that's the purpose of this little exercise, which one do you like? Do you like number one? We're clear. And by the way, that, that's a 20 and a 40 period moving average, the red and the blue. So we've been falling. We have whatever down here and we start to take off. Would you like to enter and against it? And again, we're talking about entering. Y yes, we're going to enter over the high of that bar, blah, blah, blah. So we're talking about entering on this next bar over the high. I'm not going to, you know, it's not like uh, a, a trick. And then number two. Um, and by the way, this next bar on number two, this next bar does trade over the high of that red bar. Okay. It, it just so you know, it's, I'm showing you charts. It's free falling. It's it's it does trade over the high of that bar. So I just didn't want to show you the result, but it does trade over the high of that bar. And then number three, we've already like you know we had this gap down, and then another puke, and then a green bar, and then a green bar that trades above the high of another green bar. And then number four, <clears throat> we just have this with this little pullback in here, and you'll trade over the high of that bar there. While I've been talking to you all, most of you, very nice job. Most of you have given answers, which I, I think is, well, I, I'd like to say I appreciate because I appreciate the feedback. But hopefully you appreciate too because it makes you think a little bit about it. And number three and number four. Let me ask you this because I want to take a second here. Why, why whatever you said, and you, you know, there are a ton of you answered, so I'm not going to have a discussion with any one of you. But why? What was, the, if you put the one to five words, what is the thing you like about that chart? And again, this is, I'm putting this in the category of almost an exercise to help or not help you. You may not like the help I'm giving you. You may say, I'm an idiot when we're all done. But what, what, what is it that you like about that chart? You feel safer. You know, and repeat the number so I can read it because you feel safer with four. Okay. Now, safer in terms of like not stopping out, Julie, is that what four, is that what safe means to you? Is it support. T. Smith, which one did you like support for? Number four, pullback. Mars for rising 20. Okay. There's a trend with four. Okay. Uptrend to minor support. Trending. Three is not a pullback. It's climactic. Val Valdino saying three is not a pullback. It's, it's climactic. I'm not categorizing what any strategy is or anything. I'm just saying, what do you like? I don't, I don't care if you're going to call it the double Heimlich reverse overstuff play, but whatever it is, what would you like to do? Trading with the trend. Um, extend and move down. 180 reversal. Solid green. Well, Reg, that's an interesting answer. Is, is, that a, is that a strategy to you? Or is that a verbal description of what you see? Blast through, pull back, take it off. Four is an uptrend, not from 20. Like the spike volume. 
struggling on the way down, large bars up. Three is far below 20, you can always exit if day trading. Four pulling back, reverse over stuff is <laughs> usually a great pull. <laughs> Three over so, okay. Well, let me stop right here because another thought just popped into my head that wasn't part of my discussion originally, and that was this. When you gave your answer, boy, this is a, this is a great comment I'm about to say. I didn't realize what a great idea this was. When you just gave your answer, did you just pick a chart you liked, just like you were looking at, you know, pictures of people and said, gee, I like that guy, I like that girl? Or, and then did you go and justify your answer by just picking on things on the chart? Like saying, well, it really fell a lot, and then it reversed. Uh, gee, it looks like it's really strong. Or did you, in your mind, did you categorically say, here are strategies I know that I like. Do any of these fit that blueprint? And did you understand that question? How about that first? Did you understand that question and or did you understand the tremendous importance of that question? See, the, one of the hardest things I have when I'm teaching people, even people who go through the class one time, is that they come back to me with a trade that I think is just stupid, quite honestly. I mean, I don't say that typically in that strong a word, but you know, in my mind I'm thinking, what are they doing? This isn't what was taught. And I'll try and explain that. You know I get back? I, yeah, you're right, I do say that sometimes. But <laughs> well, in all fairness, you know, you should know the truth. But when I get back sometimes is our arguments about things that they see, but they don't come together to make a set of probabilities, i.e. a strategy. Do you know what I'm saying? I just start to hear things like, well, this has really dropped a lot, and now it's reversed. You know what I'm saying? And I have to look and say, well, that's not a strategy, right? You know, T, I never knew what that meant. I know it's from Forrest Gump, I, and my wife's tried to explain to me. I've never really understood what that line means, stupid is stupid. So I'm not really sure if that was a jab at me or not. I'm not sure, but it's okay because I, I don't even really know for sure what it means. But do you see what I'm saying, though, folks? If you are just trying to justify your belief about a chart, you're going to be struggling all the time. Does, does that make sense to you? Just, just those words. If you just get a belief about a chart and then you are justifying your belief, you're always going to struggle. See, you have to look at a chart and it's not that you should look at the chart and say, no, that could never rally. You have to be able to look at a chart and you say, you know what, that's not high odds. That's not what I'm comfortable with for whatever reason and be able to just categorize it that way. Okay. Now, this one here, a lot of people are drawn to this because it dropped a lot and then you have this wide range bar, right? And somewhere once upon a time, somebody taught you that a wide range bar um, can begin a new move and, and it can, but it's not a strategy. Do you understand what I mean, everybody? A wide range bar starting a new move is an occurrence, it's a thing, it's a statistic, it's a one-off. It's part of something else. But a wide range bar in the middle of an all out downtrend usually represents what, everybody? Important you know this. See, a lot of people don't tell you this. Yeah, short covering, right, short covering. No, short, well, some hope, yeah, some hope. But a lot of short covering, right? People have been short, 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 and all of a sudden you get this rally and everybody says, okay, time to get out. And Julie, then you get some people saying, oh, wide range bar starting a new move. Well, again, that's not a strategy. I don't teach a strategy. Some of you have been through class with me, tell me if I'm lying. I don't teach a strategy that says, oh, here's a wide range bar, let's go long. That's not a strategy. That's a, oh, okay, there's something going on. That has to match up with other things on the chart. So again, if we, if we could see a weekly chart or something else, it would be helpful in this case. But generally speaking, when you have that, this is all you're going to get. You, you get the little, I, I, well, it's not really a whack-a-mole pattern, but you get the little hurrah, and then the shorts get out, and then everybody looks around and says, well, who's going long? And, you know, if these people don't get rewarded down here, they start getting out, and that's what you get. Now, you may be finding a bottom, right? It, it did. It actually made a newer high, but did you live through this? I mean, if you went long at the end of this bar, did you live through this? You, I mean, it depends on the chart you're playing. You might have, but I mean, that's not an entry you're proud of, right? That's not an entry that you're happy about. So, I mean, this to me is not 
a good setup because there's no strategy. You're just falling and a green bar comes along. That happens all the time. Again, look at your charts. And again, I want to emphasize that, yes, I can find a chart to demonstrate what I'm saying. And yes, I know you could find a chart to prove what I just told you wrong, right? Because this is about, this is about odds. I'm just telling you, this is the norm. Why am I telling you that? Well, because I've been looking at charts every day for 20 years. Sure, there are anomalies, but you don't play the anomalies. You play what happens most of the time. And this is a terrible pattern to be trying to trade. It's almost the classic, oops, that's really a bad trade type of thing, all right? If you anticipate the washout move and size your initial... Yeah, there, there's always some ifs and whatever. And yeah, you're talking about kind of averaging into a position in a certain area, you know, and sure, not the point of the question. I mean, yeah, you can come back and justify any one of these, but it's just not going to be the best answer. Uh, nope, uh, it was on the watch list for that consolidation pullback and then finding a reason to enter on a, on a breakout. Okay. All right, so then let's take the next one here. Now, this next one, and I, you know, I didn't really add up what you guys said, and I didn't look what you said. So there's too many of you answering, which is great. But and, and don't worry about what you said. You know, you, you may be right in your own justification, in a sense. But I just wanted to go through this. Number two. Number two is often tempting. Why is number two often tempting? Whether you said it or not, even whether you thought you liked number two or not, why is number two often tempting? Looks like he's taking a breath. It's a very strong, right? It's a, you say, wow, we want to play strength. Boy, we're playing strength. And this is this one's almost maybe the heart of my discussion a little bit. And I agree. This is a strong stock. And I agree. That thing's probably going to have a big move sometime. But here's my problem. I, don't, I would never play that pattern. Never. Never. Never, ever play that pattern. Now, here's why some people play that pattern. You know why? The reason that this becomes a favor for a lot of people is because you will see this happens sometimes. You'll see a very shallow pullback and boom, just takes off, right? And people, what people like to do a lot is to kind of what I call reverse engineer. In other words, they find these huge moving stocks and they go back and say, how can I get into these? And to me, that is just completely the wrong way to do things. Completely the wrong way. Don't, don't, you look for these home run trades, but here's the problem. What I'm going to get to is, is going to be called precision. In other words, you don't make a lot more money on a big move if you don't have a clue where to get into it. Does that make sense? You don't make, right? Is that true? I mean, the way I think everybody listening to me would trade is you, you don't make more money on a big move if, if the entry is proportionately as wide and sloppy, right? $6 move, but you have a $2 stop. And, and not only that, what if you don't even know where the entry is? Then you have to factor in how many times you have to try it. See, again, people will send me charts and say, oh, Paul, you're wrong. Look at this chart. It did this. Okay. Yeah, I know you can find a chart where this works. But let me tell you what the norm is, guys. This is the norm. That's the norm, right? That is the norm. I'm sorry. That's the norm. You can find exceptions. But here's the problem is that you may, you know, and, and by the way, whatever entry you're using, this had a couple of really bullish. See these topping tails? You remember, at one point in time, what was that topping tail, Mario? If I pick the right moment of the day on the daily chart, if I close that bar at the right moment, what was that topping tail at some point? It was a what, everybody? It was a big green bar. And boy, did that chart look good then, right? You're, you're middle of the day, you look over, you go, holy cow, that green bar just took out a whole week's worth of trading. I'm in. And what happens? By the end of the day, you're down half an hour, and then the next day, you're trash. See, it's not all just about strength. It's about who's left to buy. You have all these people that have to take profits. And the question is, well, how many took profits at that point as compared to how many people who were down here want to buy it at this high of a price? Well, the answer is not enough. It's the balancing act between buyers and sellers. I will never try to buy something like that, never. Ken, uh, number two was the widening of the 20 and 40. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Ken, yeah, I, I didn't want to get into, yes, I'm not really... I'm kind of here more on a visual voting, trying to point out some big stroke things, Ken. But you're, you're right. I mean, the, the separation of 20 and 40, and when we get into class, we get so much more detail. And again, folks, I mean, if, if you like generally what I'm talking about, and I don't, don't take this the wrong way, but I am truly talking at a kindergarten level instead of a high school or a college level. But yeah, we get into not just deciphering. This to me is a chart that's off the, off the screen crazy almost, but we get into deciphering some very, very close patterns. Like I show some charts in class where it's like, you know, the average person looking and say, well, that's a pretty good pullback. 
and I decipher why it's not. I said, no, I wouldn't do this one either, and here's why. Can we go through it? Yeah, he's talking about, and, and that's kind of, Julie, kind of a basic thing really still, but I mean, what you're looking at is, is these things, is they separate like this, and you're talking about a, a pattern that is, is that far separated on the pullback, huge odds it's not going to hold. And, and again, that's just a little visual clue. I mean, you, you can't trade totally by moving average, but again, it's one of those heads-up clues that you look for to get the odds in your favor. So let's look at this third one here. So this third one would be, if it worked, it would be in the category of being like a climactic thing. But were you guys at the last one about voids? Yeah, well, Valdino, it's, it's worse than that. It's, it's not, you're right, there's, well, the volume is all on this day here, right? Valdino, so you're right. And you could argue whether or not it's volume beginning a new move down or ending a move, right? I mean, what about this is bullish? If you were at the last class about voids, folks, is, is this right through here? If we get to this area, is this a void that's going to make this bullish? Is that, is that, if we get up to the, above this gap down day, is that bullish because there's no trades there to the left? Yeah, no, absolutely not. It's the most bearish pattern in the world. It's a visual void that doesn't mean anything. I mean, visual void is hanging on your wall and look at it because it's visual. But it, it, trading wise, there are more sellers in here than any other pattern just about. Unless, unless, like I said, unless I said last discussion when we talked about voids, it, unless you've actually hit that climactic level. If you have truly exhausted all the sellers, that's the only time that a, a void is, is, is a good thing in, in a situation like that. So, but this gap down, what does the gap down do? A gap down traps people more than anything else. In a sense, from what I can see of this chart, and again, I know we don't have every single chart here, but in a sense, we've been holding this area for a while, and this could almost be considered a professional gap down that's beginning a new move. So we drop three, four days, and what happens after dropping three or four days and people want to take some profits? Well, you get a little profit taking come in, you get a little bit of a rally, and, you, or, and then you flatline, you know? Even this pop here, as much as that, this is the whack-a-mole pop. This is now you start to rally, and everybody who's been sitting here for now one month, right? You were long this day, and you're in a lot of pain, and you're like, oh, I'm in pain, I'm in more pain, I'm in more pain, I'm in more pain. And after a month of sitting there, and, you know, your husband or wife's not talking to you anymore, you go, okay, I can get a quarter of my money back, I'll take it. And that's what everybody does, and whack, 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 whack-a-mole, and you're back down to where you were. And that'll go on for a long time. Terrible pattern to want to play. An excessive gap, I don't think I use that term. I can't explain what an excessive gap is because I don't know what an excessive gap is by definition. It means for what for what purpose are you asking is what I have to say, Valdinia. Excessive gaps could be good or bad, but excessive is a subjective term, right? When you say excessive, it's a it's a subjective term. And I don't like using subjective terms in trading more than I have to because what is what does that mean? What if it was excessive? What would that mean to you? You know what I'm saying? Whenever you start looking at the size of a gap, it's all relative to the chart volatility and the chart pattern. A very small gap, percentage-wise, Baldino could be huge on some stocks. It could be a huge moving thing, a huge strategical advantage. And there are some big gaps, be huge gaps, that don't mean anything because we can't decipher what they mean. And that leaves number four. Which is, the, which is the pattern I like. Why? Well, because it's a very tight, controlled, precise pattern. It is the highest odds of being able to find the precise turning point because these turning points don't fail very often. And by the way, I didn't search hard for these at all. I was a little behind in putting this together, to be honest with you. And I just went off the top of my head a few charts I knew that had decent patterns. I'm sure you could find better ones to make examples in either case. But I'll just hear the names. This is cold, which is, if you look at the cold weekly chart, matter of fact, as long as I have my charts, let me just show you this, because the reason I even pulled up that daily is because it has been on my long-term watch list. I've never found an entry into it, but cold, C-O-L-D. Look at this weekly chart on cold. Do you see this thing, guys? Do you see this? This is a power trend. Well, the monthly chart's a power trend. This is just a beautiful trend. This is a beautiful weekly trend. And when this weekly trend starts to tighten like this, you see this in here? You, you get to the point you can't even find like an entry concept. You come down to the daily chart and you, you got just got to pick on these boom, boom, these little buy setups. These little buy setups work beautifully 
when you're operating inside of this. Does that make sense, everyone? And that's the precision that I teach and I like to look for. And I know I'll miss some stuff. Somebody will show me one day, boy, look at this crazy blah, blah, blah. I'm going to buy this here. Okay, great. You know, you made money. Great. Okay. But I mean, I don't, I don't see the reliability in doing that all the time. So this is what I look for because these are the precise patterns I like. Wait, say that again. Play the odds. Yeah. I'm not sure what I said, Rich. I like the tight, precise pattern. I, I said when, when, you, when you have a pullbacks like this on a daily chart that are happening inside of this type of a chart, these work because there is this huge money buying this. The, the title of that section there, if, if I had a title, I guess would be, you know, I, I, that I think precision is the best because you end up making the most money, you know, because, you know, everybody, see everybody, just think about mentally guys, what you do. Everybody looks at this chart and says, wow, you know, look at that move. Look at that little stop in there. It's 25 cents and move $12. That's a 48 risk reward ratio. What, what's the problem with that thinking? There's two problems with that thinking. But this is what traders do to try and shortcut the process. Instead of learning, what do I trade? They look for something like this and say, oh, how do I get into that? Do you see the problem? What's the problem with thinking like that? What's the problem with thinking like that? By the way, the next section is the best section for tonight. Yeah, well, num number one, how did you know that's the entry? You're data mining, right? That's a nice term for it, Eric. Yeah, I call it reverse engineering, right? But you're saying the same thing, right, Eric? Right. How, how do you know that was the entry? Why didn't you take this one? Or why didn't you take that one? Or, you know, this one happened to work, but what if it failed once? I mean, there's just, you're just saying there's a big move. There's where it started. Next time I'll get it there. Okay, define that for me. You know, here's the way to say it is, okay, I agree with you. It's a great move. You define this for me so I can get on the next chart. How's that? How would you define that? And the other thing is a miracle happens, right? And you get this entry. Woohoo! Right? You, you tried 22 times and you missed it, but now you got it. What do most people do with this anyhow? Yeah. What do most people do anyhow? They, they sell it up in here somewhere, right? Just to try and cover their losses from the first three times they tried it, right? Does that ever, do you ever do that, guys? You, you're, you're trading, you got some losses, you finally get a winning trade, and what do you say? You say, well, you know what? If I, if I kill this here, I'll kind of be break even, and then I can start all over again. And then guess what happens? The process starts all over again. Loser, loser, loser. Oh, I can maybe get break even here. Let's do that. And you eventually are literally trading to be break even. And guess what? If your goal is to be break even, you might achieve it. All right, let's get on to the best slides. KMT daily. And this is uh, something from yesterday. I think you will like this concept here. So here's the daily chart. This is from yesterday. Yesterday, the stock gapped down to here. Do you see what happened? This is a green bar this day. So it closed up here. So this is a big gap down yesterday. Ended up closing green, but still below yesterday's, or right around yesterday's. Low. Does everybody understand the daily chart before I move on? Because that's the only time you're going to see it. All we're getting from this daily chart is that, to me, and let's just agree, let's not, this discussion is not about whether or not this chart is bearish. I'm going to tell you that's a bearish gap. Presumably. Doesn't mean it's going to for sure fall. Yeah, well, that topping tail is interesting. It's going to become a little bit of part of the story. I just assumed it wasn't there, but that actually is part of the discussion we're going to have. So there's that gap down that day. So let's go to that day. So we're going to look at this day, which was yesterday. You can follow KMT if you want along on your charts. Bearish gap down this day. Here's the five minute chart, and I'm going to start covering some things up. So what happened was the stock had a, just a, a nutsy run out of the open. That's a real bar that really happened, right? And that, I'm just going to tell you, that to me makes me stand aside for a minute. Now, sometimes not. Sometimes that big rally, I, I, I like to short that. when it, It's what I call a flurry. When you have a flurry rally, I like to do it. But not when it takes out that much stuff. I, I like the flurry rally when it still is bearish, even when it's done with the flurry. So I, and I don't think I was staring at this. I did have this on my screen. It was, a, it was kind of a favorite gap, but whatever either i like something else or i just saw that rally and i don't i don't remember what i wasn't staring at this i said i'll let this settle down so as it settled down i started watching here right so here it comes here it comes boom 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 that's finally settled down and we start to see that the bears are winning the battle right every little pop the lower lows are a little bit lower a little bit lower a little bit lower and the question to you is going to be let me make sure i don't screw up my slides here 
should we go short as we make a new low of the day? We, we have a bearish gap. I, I'm, it's not a trick. I mean, I'm calling it a bearish gap, whether it turns out to be or not. Um, I, I want to be short. I did have to let it settle down. And now we're about to take out the low of the day. Do we want to go short or not? Discussion. It says I have to discuss, so i got to stop and discuss here. Would it, if you say no, would it be a crazy idea to go short? If you say yes, I guess I'd ask you, where would you put your stop? Go ahead, take a minute, look it over, think about it. And again, you, for the purpose of this discussion, um, don't get turned, you know, the last charts I showed you were daily charts. Um, don't get turned off if you're not a day trader. This is a five minute chart on a gap, but the, the concept I'm teaching has nothing to do really with it being a gap or a five minute chart. The concept lives on, depends on the past day's trend. Well, let me take you back, Gabriel. I mean, the past day is out of the picture. The past day is all above us. We gap down below the last three, four days of trading. So there's nothing off to our left in terms of what's there. The only thing that's there is today's low. So once you're below here, you've got a, you know, a way to go. Well, I'd go long on support, depends on the longer time frame. Well, I'm, I'm showing you the bigger time frame. There's the daily chart. Is this major support? Well, I, well <laughs> that's what I'm asking you at the moment, I guess, Joe. Well, we're going to break it, by the way. I mean, we're going to break. Here, here we go. We break down and we break below. So is this a good trade? And by the way, after we broke down, this next bar went below the low of that bar. Oh, do I really have to go back to the daily again? You would with a tight stop, Gabriel? And why with a tight stop? What does that mean to you? Does that mean you're risking less money so you'll just throw a few bucks at it? Or do you mean that you would risk your full amount and just have a really snug stop? I would at the MA only. Well, nothing to go on. We just broke the low for the last six days. I mean, that's not nothing to go on. And I'm not trying to talk you into something. I'm just keeping it clear what we are here. We have a stock that gapped down below the low of the prior day, the last two, three days. And now after a, a big battle, we're taking out the low. That's a good point, Reg. Remember, it's, it's not, you know, something I've quoted to say. It's not, it's not what happens. It's the reaction to what happens, right? So it's not that one bar. It's how is that reacted? Wouldn't you? Let me, okay. Thanks for your comments. Let me, let me run through it here and do what I have to do here, which is to kind of teach my point here. Number one, by definition, for me, I could never go long this pattern, no matter what it does. Why is that? Anybody guess why? Doesn't matter. I don't care what happens here. There's nothing that could happen this morning, at least before noon. Nothing to do with the MAs, no. no nothing to do with the MAs. On gaps, I don't even look at MAs. Gaps are irrelevant. On I, I'm, I'm, Moving averages are irrelevant on gaps in my book. It doesn't matter at all. I don't even look at them. Could care less. Right, Mario. This is a very bearish gap. Descending MAs don't mean anything in this case. If I'm going long on a bullish daily chart, I'm going to be taking the entry below descending 15 minute moving averages. That doesn't mean anything. Descending moving averages is meaningless to me. It's the whole picture of cross multiple time frames, right? On a, on a gap that's that bearish, I will never play along, right? The pressure is down. If it's a bearish gap, Boy, you guys like declining MAs. It's not even a valid answer to me, to be honest with you. I mean, on a play like this. Yeah, th this, on a gap that bearish, I, I won't play it long. You're fighting the bigger time frame. Now, again, the time frame in this case, the bias is being determined by a gap, not the trend per se. I mean, that's the thing about gaps. That's why they're unique. That's why I teach them separately. You can change the bias on a daily chart instantly. So that bearish for a gap, it can't go long. So I want to be short. To me... I'm glad most of you answered in, in an intelligent way, but to me, going short here is not only not what I would do and not only a bad idea, it is just wrong. As a matter of fact, this is what I label the second biggest mistake traders make. That's a big title, by the way, second biggest mistake traders make. I want you to take a look. You can see it here. I don't need to show you any other chart, but I just want to show you the 15-minute chart at this time. Here's what it looks like. Do you see what you're shorting? Yeah, you already have a multiple bar drop to a support area. Now, even if you don't think this is a good support area, which it's not, you don't short a multiple bar drop because it goes pennies below the low. This is what you care about. The fact that you've already exhausted all this selling. 
I want a fresh charge to go lower, right? You see what I'm saying, everybody? You never take this trade. This trade is always, always wrong. If it, and by the way, that doesn't mean it can't drop. And this is the important thing in trading. If it did free fall from here, I would just say, okay, bye. I didn't get it. So what you do is you sit and watch it and you say, okay, here we go. It came back a little bit. Should I short it here? That's going to be the next question. When I pull out that little red ball and click on it, it's going to say, boom. Okay. So it made that new low. It popped a little bit. Should I short it there? If you did short it, by the way, do you hang with it now? You're expecting it to free fall drop. Do you hang with it right now? Or do you just get out? Or do you lower your stop to that topping tail? And if you're not in it, is this where you get in on this little cell setup here? Is this where you get in? Lower the stop. If not short, do you get in short? Next chart. Discuss. We see some more of the chart. How about now? How about now? You're stopped out. Now we're looking to get short. So here's where we are right in here, where this starts to be a good area to be looking. And by the way, stick with me to the end of this conversation because I have a little surprise for you. Well, you know, prior resistance is, is a tough thing to say in a pattern like this, Steve, because I actually don't even really want horizontal resistance. I'd take it, but I'd like to see selling continue. But this is what I want to see now. You see, in other words, the, the pattern I want to play is kind of, let me draw some arrows here, is kind of is kind of this pattern. You know what I mean? It's not precise, but, you know, it's kind of channeling lower. So I want to see that bounce up to that area where selling pressure is. It's not always easy to decide. To be honest with you, right in here, I think you can have the discussion about getting short here. I mean, I don't think it's bad there. There is a balancing act that you have to do. And what is that balancing act? I don't care what you want to use to enter. You can talk about a prior low of a bar, or you can pull out some technical indicator, whatever it is, you might get in and then it may not work. But what's the balancing act you have to do in your head right here? Well, yeah, size versus target, but what does that translate to in English? If you had a non-trader sitting next to you and they, and they said, what are you debating? What's your big, what's your big debate? What, what's the trade-off in your head that you're doing? Well, if you get in now and you're not sure that it's the right area, you may stop out or you may never make money because you got in too soon, right? But if you don't get in, you may miss the trade. Guys, isn't that a real thing to consider? You may miss the trade. Isn't that something to consider? Yeah, it is. Now, I, I know, and before anybody types it on the screen, I, I know somebody's taught you somewhere in your past that miss money is better than lost money. That's not the best saying in the world to me at all. It's not the best saying. It's not. I don't really agree with that saying. Missing money is not okay. If, if you have the play of the week sitting in front of you, if you have the play that's going to make your week salary, and you just go, eh, well, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure if I should take it or not. And you just let it go. That's not okay. You could lose four R's, three R's on a trade. You could lose half your week's salary. If you take a trade and it doesn't work, you could lose anywhere from a fraction to a full risk unit. I mean, you actually have more to lose in opportunity than you by not taking it if it's the proper trade. Does that make sense? So we're here now at this point in this chart to me. This is where you have a valid discussion. I mean, this is a legit strategy to me now to be entering. Now, I have to tell you, in the heat of the moment, I know we're all sitting here. And we, you know, right now I'm talking to all the smart people, all the smart Marios, the smart Valdinios, the smart Davids. I'm talking all the smart and the smart Paul, me too, right? But at 11 o'clock in the morning, who's making this decision? And this is an important point. Who's making that decision to say, ah, I think I'm going to jump into that? Yeah, that, that other guy that we have to live with all day long if you day trade, which is the idiot, right? And I've got to tell you, I'm willing to bet that, you know, an awful lot of you an awful lot of the time will do that. Now, I won't do that one. I, I've, I've do other dumb things. I told you I made a mistake yesterday, Monday. I made a mistake yesterday. You know, I wrote to the room and said, this trade's a bad trade. I whoop is a whoops. <laughs> And I, I, I still do that a couple times a month, maybe, or something, maybe every three weeks. This is a short. This is absolutely a short. The gap tells me I have no option but to find a short entry. Okay? So the point is, at this point here, you have a discussion with yourself, or your, your, your plan has to evolve to say, okay, is this, do I, am I willing to miss that? 
or what I teach is a way to get the best of both worlds in a sense, which is to say to not miss it and also not to necessarily stop out of it. Yeah, we got to be careful about using MAs at all in gaps. I mean, on a big gap, you'll never see this MA. You won't see it for, for two days. <laughs> I mean, you can't, the moving averages, let me just make this very clear. I mean, again, there's, there's some things we can argue about. There's some things there's right or wrong. On an intraday chart, the moving averages are completely worthless on a stock that gaps. Period. There's no discussion. Don't care. They're just worthless. You can take them off your chart. And by the way, I like moving averages more than the average person. They're worthless. Okay? So don't talk to me. Sometime later in the day, they catch up and they can make sense again. But in the morning, these just don't mean anything. They're just whatever. I don't understand why this is even on ones of the radar after 10 threes. Maybe have a chart somewhere. Um, but there has to be other. Well, because of this gap, Trader Jeff, again, if, if you like gaps, this is a very bearish gap, and it had me wanting to do this. And actually, this is a trade I actually did. So then the next level up. Now, what I want you to be aware of here is I'm watching the stock, right? And I'm going through this thought process the whole time, right? Wait, 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 wait. And took one more leg up, and here's where I shorted it. Boom, 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 boom. Here's where I get it. Now, what are the advantages of waiting that far? Well, what's the biggest disadvantage of waiting that long? I'm a little over. We're going to be done in about five minutes here. What's the biggest disadvantage of waiting that long? Well, into resistance, that's an advantage. Yeah, I, mean, I assume that's one of your answers. Right. I, I may have never got it. I mean, what if right here, it just collapsed? If it collapsed, I would have just never been in it. I would have been just looking at it saying, I may have got an entry later somewhere. I maybe could take the next setup somewhere. But that setup I was waiting for, I would have just missed, right? And that is the balancing act you have to do to some extent. So I kind of had the patience to wait for up here. Notice my entry. Do you see my entry here? It's under 29.59. You can't really see it that well in the chart, but I want you to understand um, that that was not under the low of that bar. That was in the middle of that bar. We were just trading. We were just... We were just running up, and I said, okay, it's time. What you would call no entry concept at all. Why? Because that was the moment to do it. And I, I know this is, <laughs> I didn't even notice, I honestly didn't even notice that this happened to be hitting the moving average. I mean, I just noticed it now for the first time. That had nothing to do with it, trust me, nothing at all. I didn't even see that until right now. Honestly didn't. Nothing to do with it whatsoever. So what I want to kind of get across is, wouldn't you... Yeah, Julie, I, you were typing that as I was saying it. No, ne never even saw that. I honestly didn't. Never even saw it. I should have just taken the moving averages off this. But wouldn't you like to have the confidence to be able to say, yeah, that's that's what I wait for. And again, you may not like this trade. You may not like this chart. You may not like gaps. You may not like intraday. But I'm just saying in general, whatever you do, wherever you get into something, do you have or would you like to have the confidence to say, look, I know this chart. I know the strategy. Here is where I'm getting in period. And I'll stretch this far if I need to, and otherwise I sit there and wait. Do you trade like that? Does the chart push you around, or do you demand the chart meet your expectations? Now let me say one more thing to you. Reg, beyond the conversation, not really the point of it right now. The point is not technically wide again. The point is this, is that do you have the confidence to get in there? Now, if you do not have the confidence to know to enter here, then it's your understanding of charts, right? If you do know to wait for this and not take this, but you don't, then what's the problem? It's in the category of discipline. Let me say this again. If you know in general that you should never take this and you should wait for some kind of rally, if you don't know to do that, I mean, then you're not reading charts properly. You don't understand what you should be doing. If you do know that, but you don't do it, then it's, patience. It's discipline. It's not following the plan. It's a psychological issue. It, it's a combination of both. And by the way, when you really get down to it, to me, the entry is everything. This entry has nothing to do with trend lines, moving averages, none of that stuff. It's, 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 it's hard to use that per se like that. The best entries don't use that. Look at my entry. Learn from it. Under 29.59, stop over 30. It depends how you do it. D, sometimes. Yes, no. But also, if your reliability increases to the point, you increase your risk to make what you need to make, rather than trying to make 27 hours a day. Next next slide. And by the way, this is not a home run trade. This is part of the thing here. But actually, the reason was, Julie, this is the widest bar on the chart. That was the biggest reason. That is the widest bar of the move up. I needed to get into this general area, 
To be honest with you, Julie, I could have done it here. Just, and it wouldn't have mattered if I did, to be honest with you. It wouldn't have mattered. Look where my stop was. It wouldn't have mattered. But what's one of the big advantages of getting filled up there at 29.58? You know one of the big advantages is? Guess what? When I come down to here, it's worth taking some profit. It's worth taking some profit. Now, why is that worth taking profit there? And here, here we're crossing into an area that I think is no longer in the right and wrong category, just to be clear. It's my style, more or less. But why would you take some profit there? Now, Valen, Valdino, I, I keep telling you, the moving averages are not even a factor in anything to do with this. If you're looking at that, you're going to lose all the time. Well, the reason is this, is because the great thing about this entry is I can look at the low of the day as being a profit-taking spot. And what I do then is I take a, a third off in this case. I take a third off and I bring my stop down now to exactly where I get in, just above that area. And guess what? This is a green trade now, no matter what. I call it a free trade, right? Think about it. I've taken a third and the rest of the stop ends up coming down to about a one quarter risk. So it's profitable no matter what happens. So I can go, go for a, a run, go for a bike ride, go to the store, go walk the dogs. Go do whatever I want to do for a couple hours. I could also enter another trade because I have no risk in this trade. Does that make sense, everyone? And here's what can happen. I'll get your questions in a minute. I'm going to finish this thought here. So I, so I took a third there, and here's what happened. It came back, and I lowered my stop to right here then. The rest of it went out right there, and it never fell anymore the rest of the day. So you're saying, well, Paul, you're showing us this trade. It made like a half of an hour profit. Okay, but you know what? Any other way you did this, you would have lost money. Right? I mean, if you shorted the low here, you would have lost. You never even would have been break even. If you, even if you had the knowledge of God to get out here, you, you would have never been in the green. So it's a, it's a case to me where great entries are absolutely everything. All right. Does this um, area to initiate the short have any of a topping tail around 11, 1030? And yeah, Reg, it all has something to do with it. I mean, again, this is a whole picture of stuff. And again, a big thing here is the entry. The entry paints a broad stroke that allows for a lot of slop. It gives me huge confidence, some of these entries like this. Steve, I, I do sometimes. Um, it has to be the right setup. But what happens a lot of times, Steve, is when I have, you can't add to the winner, obviously, unless you are bringing a stop down somewhere or unless you've taken some profit, right? Uh, unless you start off with less than full shares. But if you start off with full shares and you're at full risk, you can't just add to it because you'd be over. So at the time that I bring a stop down or take some profit, what often happens, Steve, is I often get interested in another trade. So in a sense, I add to my portfolio for that day by taking another trade, but sometimes not on the same one. Oftentimes I get more interested in another trade and it allows me then to take another trade. If this one is no longer possible going negative, I can take a second or a third trade or whatever it is. Okay. Let me make another point here. We're kind of running long on time here, but I, I thought it was a good session here. What happened yesterday actually was I, I taped this part of the room. And I don't normally ever tape the room. But when we were down here at the low, I started to say to the room, you know, this is where idiots get in, right? Room members, you remember me talking about this? And you probably heard me say, hey, wait a minute. And I, I went quiet for a minute. And I started up the court. I said, hey, I'm doing this presentation tomorrow. I need an example of some things. Why not let them listen to me talk about this in real time? So what you actually have in your email right now, uh, well, does, but what I did, you're going to love this little follow-up here today. What I actually did was I took this last part and I made it into a little educational lesson for all of you. And it includes a little three-minute recording of me talking while this is going on. So what I want to get across is, guys, is it's not just me pulling up a chart after the fact and telling you how wonderful this is because here's a chart I found and here's what I know after the fact. This was happening real time. and I just wanted to show it to you. So I turned on the recorder for, um, well, what I was hoping was, to be honest with you, hang on, you, you'll have this momentarily. What I was um, hoping would happen was that this would have rallied back real quickly while I was you know, recording, but it took an hour. So I got off the mic at some point, you know, in here, and I was doing other stuff watching it. And then, you know, I was just watching, watching, watching. Okay, and then decided to take it at some point. So you have a recording of me talking for three, four, five minutes. 
and then you know fade to black you know i'm off the mic and then come back you know i just come back to, to show what happened here but it's just showing you know the patience you have to have to wait for that i mean do you have those patients right that's the question for you do you have those patients where do you get patience where do you get patience you know to me you, <laughs> don that's that's my joke you beat me to it yeah you get patience from confidence experience kind of along the same thing right you get patience from confidence you get patience from saying you know what i know this will come back and it'll land somewhere in here and this is where a lot of you guys i think mess up is like you get all hyped up on what's the exact number what's what's the moving average where's it you know all this way all, all your questions back they're all asking that you all want to know to the penny where this is going to go you know where it's going to go it's going to go to here somewhere and this is where i talk about the difference my first and second classes the first class teaches you kind of what to look for the second class teaches you how do you do this and make money because all the stuff you're looking for i think it's kind of a waste of time for the most part you got you got to strategically look for the bigger picture and then understand entries better. I think that's the secret a lot of people have to have. But you get patience from having the confidence to know what's going to happen. And where do you get confidence? You get confidence from really knowing and understanding the charts well and, and practicing with them and really learning some of this stuff to a level most of you don't know or understand. You know, the more and more that I talk with some of my seminar people that are doing really well and the more i talk to some people who are always you know forever kicking around taking the program and never do the more i come to realize you know that how do i say this i mean just what i'm teaching is extremely valuable i mean these the people that are doing well are really getting it and the people that are hesitating i think are just making a mistake because there is so much to learn every time somebody comes in and learns they're like i had no idea there's so much to learn i had no idea how much you could understand in a chart and I see and get these emails all the time from people trying to struggle with, okay, well, why was that the entry? And it's, well, it's not because this crossed that. It's not because that was the exact level of the prior pivot. It's a bigger concept than that. And it's, it's stuff that, you know, what I go through and, and, and teach over time. One more slide here um, on tidbit. I'd rather have a great entry to a so-so setup than a so-so setup, on a, than a so-so entry on a great setup. I, I don't think some of you will understand that which is okay. Some of you may not even agree with that. I think it takes things kind of to a level that a lot of people don't get to and because it kind of, it, it contradicts the saying out there that you should only trade perfect patterns. I think that's a fallacy. Some of my other, another presentation, I talked about the fallacy of perfect patterns and how it probably hurts people more than helps them, right? Entry is everything. I mean, it, it is. I believe that. Um, Friday, folks, there is the Introduction to Mastering Technical Analysis class you're all invited to. If you've only been through it once or less, I suggest you attend that. I will hang around and answer questions for a minute or two. And I also would highly encourage any of you who have been kicking around to get into the seminar program. The seminar program starts Saturday, uh, the next cycle. I teach it every six to eight weeks. That's the intro class this Friday. You're all invited to that. And then Saturday starts the, the summer program. you got to pay a ton of money for that, so um, don't even ask. But you get the summer program is a couple things. It includes unlimited coaching and an unlimited commitment by me to get you to understand this. I don't disinvite my seminar people. I tell them to come here. They're all here. If I was lying to you, they would stick their hands up and say, Paul's lying to you. I'm not lying to you. And do whatever is necessary to make you guys understand this. You get unlimited retakes, unlimited coaching that you need, practical application and review days and scanning nights. These are the three main classes. They will happen the next three Saturdays. And January 1st, the price of this is going to go up. It's going to go up so that more people will take it in the future. I've had people literally tell me that they have not taken this they went somewhere else because they didn't feel that i could provide all that for that money which is kind of a stupid way of looking at it but all right thanks thanks can i put number five back up for a moment the four charts votes results sure let me know if you have any questions five boy that's way back there you know and let me put this little shortcut thing up here any questions anybody how's that glenn well, Glenn, that's why I tell you guys to attend these. You know, it's you may pick up stuff out of this more than you'd believe. Thanks, guys.
again, I mean, if you like this, I'm, I'm, I'm almost teaching at a kindergarten level in here. And that's why I don't mind doing it. it it's, it's, it, imagine 25 hours of this. And that's why when you go through it, yeah, you're not, you're not going to get it all the first time. That's why you have to go through a couple times. Anything else going on? So we have, so Friday, I'll see you guys for the intro class. Everybody's going to be invited to you. Get an invite to that. And that's about it. Room members, I'll see you in the morning, I guess, right? Thanks, Phil Denio. Thanks, T. Thanks, guys. All right, questions going once, going twice. You guys are such a limited question group. All right. See you guys in the trading room, for those of you who are going to be there, or see you guys on Friday then. Have a great evening.